Hey, this is FBG Jen and FBG Kristen. And I'm FBG Margo, host and producer. You're listening to the podcast that will help you keep a lid on the junk in the trunk and inspire you to live a happy and confident life. Each episode, we chat with motivational experts and celebs and share our own candid adventures in being healthy. If you're looking for a podcast that's equal parts hilarious and enlightening, well then welcome to the Fit Bottom Girls podcast. Welcome back to the Fit Bottom Girls podcast. This is FBG Margo, and on the line today we have FBG Jen. Hello. And we have FBG Kristen. Hi, guys. And Kristen, this is your kind of show today because, well, you're not a dirty vegan, but you are a vegan. No? No. I I eat eggs and dairy, and I also eat seafood. Um, but I do enjoy a lot of vegan meals. Right. So is that pescatarian? How is that? That is that is pescatarian, although it's that's one of those terms that it's becoming more mainstream. But when I first started eating that way, I mean – nobody knew what it meant. So I never said it because I thought it sounded really pretentious. Right. Um, you know, like, oh no, I'm, I'm very special. And it's not really that. It's just that <laughs> those are the things you that are I, special. You're special. That, well, we're all very special. That's um, true. But yeah, you know, I, I didn't want people to think that I was like trying to turn it into like a thing. It just was the way that I like to eat. Like some people like to eat mushrooms and some people don't, but yeah. So I, but I have learned, like, kind of as I've gotten more into, um, you know, cooking with, like, whole natural fresh foods and all of that, like, a lot of them just, a lot of those meals just end up being vegan before I even realize it. And that's, I'm going to be honest with you, that's kind of hard for me because I, maybe it was just the way I was raised, but I was raised to eat a lot of, a lot of meat, like, for <laughs> every, almost at every single meal. And so, especially, like, st- starting to work with you guys, I'm trying to lessen that and have more veggies in my life and using veggies in place of meat. And it's actually working. And actually, you'd be proud of me. I, I cooked with a, um, a non-dairy cheese. And it's made from coconut oil, and it was crazy delicious. And it, I was like, oh, I can do this. So nice. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. Kristen, you and I were on this interview today, and her name is Catherine Gill, and she has a blog called The Dirty Vegan, and she just launched her first cookbook, which is actually very beautiful, and it's called The Dirty Vegan Cookbook. So, Kristen, why is she called The Dirty Vegan? Well, you know, that's not something that we – actually got into but I suspect it's because she's not a vegan in that she well I mean she is a vegan but she is not one who's like you need to snack on carrot sticks and kale but she um you know she's like hey here's how I make mac and cheese but I make it in a vegan version for in a vegan version and she has she also has a um a bakery where she makes veganized versions of like normal desserts that you would go and get at a non-vegan bakery. So she, I think she really has a cool approach at trying to make vegan eating and cooking and baking accessible and fun and delicious for people who don't necessarily think that that's a lifestyle choice that they would want to make. So she was talking in the interview, and this is an idea that's been out for quite a while now, but if you're thinking of trying to cut down on your meat consumption like I am, because you want to be kinder to yourself and also to the planet and to, of course, the animals that we all love. So she talks about meatless Mondays. And so I wanted to ask you guys, like, what are your favorite meatless meals? Ooh, Is veganized a word? Is that a word? Totally. You said that, Kristen, and I was like, is that a word? I like that word. Anyway, yes. So meatless meals, I am kind of like in the Margot camp where there is a lot of protein that happens um, in this house. But I will say um, that my favorite kind of meatless meal is always just like a good chili. And maybe it's just the time of year too. But like like tons of veggies, tomatoes, zucchinis, mushrooms. Mm. <laughs> it's been a lot of mushroom talk today between us. But mushrooms like kale tons of spices um a good veggie broth i think it just like is a really delicious way to eat a ton of vegetables and it's warm and it's filling and if you top it with a little bit of um like avocado slices Mm. mm, so good so good i want like a bowl of that right now (laughs) okay so that that brings up a question for me because as someone who has not eaten meat or, you know, poultry in, you know, I don't know, 15 years or something now, I find that I, if I'm going somewhere and eating, or if I'm buying a pre-made soup, even when it's a vegetable 
something. So often it's made with chicken stock. And I'm mm-hmm. really curious, do you guys find that it makes it that much more flavorful than a good veggie stock? Or is that just a go-to? Because it's I, really frustrating for me. I will tell yeah, you that. I, I think imagine. it's a go-to. I can imagine. I think yeah. so too. I think, I think it's, it's a I go-to. It's, yeah. I think it's a lot. Yeah. I think there's a lot with the, um, like, cause bone broth is now so popular now for the college and other things right. we talked about on other shows. So I think that that's kind of a new trend that maybe is like different but complementary. But I think a lot of times it's just like, well, what is easiest to buy? Like it, for a long time, I felt like at major grocery stores, y- you couldn't really buy like a can or a quart of veggie stock unless you went to like a Whole Foods or natural market or something like that. Yeah. Now maybe. I'm see better veggie stock, but yeah. But I, I think as far as like restaurants, I think it's just a pain in the ass. I think they just... Yeah. They make chicken broth and that's it. Or chicken stock. And they yeah. don't tell you about it. I mean, you have to really ask. You have to ask. do yeah. the hard ask for them. We have a soup place like near me. It's like a, a soup Nazi type of person. And they, they're really good about showing you which ones are the vegan options and which are, are vegetarian, nice. which are vegan, which are dairy free, which are whatever. So, yeah. But it, it is. I think it is just sort of the go-to with cooking. I rarely use vegetable broth, actually. But what, what I, I going back to mushrooms, I love mushroom broth when I'm cooking. And I'm not going to oh. use beef for chicken and it's actually well, it has that real umami. tasty it has that umami flavor you know like that richness that depth yeah yeah so that's a good way to you know if you want to mix some flavor in there but you don't want to use beef or chicken stock so so chick kristen let me ask you something because sure. you love to cook and you love to entertain so how do you do that as a vegetarian as somebody and if you're going to somebody's home you know you know they're big meters let's say if you're coming to my apartment (laughs) yeah what would you bring (laughs) well so that's that number one that's the key thing is um I do always offer to bring something and I if I know somebody and they know my eating preferences then that's really easy right then I just say you know hey you know I what what are you making what can I bring to complement it and I I usually do ask my close friends like just straight up like are you making something that I'll be able to eat or should I bring something to contribute that's going to fill me up and I'm fine with that option that's that's not a big deal you know a lot of times I think I've said this before on here but you know if I'm going to a cookout or something I don't expect people to have veggie burgers but I'll bring enough for myself and and for other people Um, because you would be surprised how many people often are like oh yeah I'll totally take one of those because maybe they just feel like it's a little lighter or whatever or they're a lot of times people don't want to speak up because they're embarrassed. So they just think, oh, I'll just have sides. If I don't know somebody, then I try not to be really pushy about it. But in that case, I would make sure to bring something like, you know, maybe some sort of a uh, a hearty salad or, you know, a pasta salad or whatever's going to complement the, the meal that's planned. I would bring something that has enough sustenance to it to to fill me up if if there's nothing else that I'm going to be able to eat and I you know one of the things that I will say is I find it less awkward to ask about it on the front end ahead of time than to have it come up at dinner time if your host has no idea and you know like put yourself yeah like put yourself in the position of the host and you've worked really hard on a meal that you want all of your guests to enjoy I mean Mm -hmm. you're not making this to like show off well maybe you're making it to show off what you can do I don't know your life but (laughs) like you know, you're, you're making this because you want the people coming to your home to enjoy it. So if somebody comes and they don't mention anything to you, and then all of a sudden you find out that they, you know, don't eat dairy or, you know, can't have gluten or whatever. And, you know, maybe they don't like mushrooms and every course you've made is filled with mushrooms. I don't know who would do that. I don't know who would do that. I have no idea who would do that. (gasps) You know, I mean, that just like, that's not, not the ideal situation. So when in, when it's possible, I really do try to just kind of have like a, a real easy, quick conversation like, hey, you know, can you tell me what's planned? Um, for the record, I don't eat this stuff, but I'm really happy to contribute, you know, a, a X, Y, Z. And I think this would be very complimentary. And I've never run into anybody who has had a problem, at least to my face. However, that being said, I'm also going to put another stipulation on this is that if you're the person going to someone's home and they make you something like special for you, like eat it, eat that don't, <laughs> you know, don't be like, Oh no, this other thing looks really good. And you know, I, I don't care if you don't like grits, if they made you grits for, you know, that you can eat because like uh, my friend made me very special grits 
at a party because she usually uses bacon. And so she made my own thing. And I was like, even if I was never going to eat grits in my life, you better bet I'm going to eat her grits right now. Um, Cause it was really lovely and thoughtful. So, I mean, it's almost like a gift, you know, like I don't eat gluten. Yeah. And if I go to someone's house and they know, you know, they know that I'm gluten free and they like, think about it, you know, and have something specifically for me. It's like, it's really, really thoughtful and really, really nice. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's just being a good guest and a good host. That's adding to the the pleasure of the evening or the event. Like you, you respect people who went out of their way for you. Of course you take a few bites if nothing mm-hmm. else. Exactly. Yeah. I have, I have Southern family too, and they make me grits every once in a while. And I'm, I'm normally not into that, but if they're making it, especially for me, of course I'm going to eat it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good grits are good. Good grits are good. Damn grits good grits are good. I had really good grits in Charleston when I was there. Oh, oh my gosh! Oh, they're amazing. Yeah, I had oh, them in Savannah. I, yeah, oh, and like lots of styles, like creamy, and I just yeah. <laughs> anyway, I had no idea. Sorry about that. Holly has strong feelings about grits, apparently. <laughs> or like, mushrooms. We've been talking about mushrooms for a while. Maybe she has some strong... I feel like the Mushroom Council is going to get in touch with us after this episode, because we've been talking about it so much. I know. So the backstory, everyone who wasn't... Um, <laughs> we wasn't were on the pre-show. Yeah, the recording. The everyone who's not us. <laughs> yeah. The, pre, the pre-pre-show... Um, I, I admitted that the first time I do something called Friend Feast, um, my husband and I do with all of our friends. I, maybe I've talked about it on here before. I've definitely talked about it on Fit Bottom Eats. But I think the first year we decided to go like multi-course and super fancy with it. I did. Um, I chose a menu that I wasn't even thinking about, but like every single course had mushrooms in it. It was like a mushroom soup, like various time, types of dried mushrooms and fresh mushrooms. And then we got to the main course and I believe it was like some sort of steak that had like arugula and more mushrooms like rolled into it. <laughs> and then we sat down and like two of the guests that we had, um, and I hadn't thought about this at all, were like, yeah, I don't like mushrooms. Oh no. Like, <laughs> like um, y'all are going to be hungry. <laughs> oh, uh, would you like me to make you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at this point? Because looking at my menu, everything is mushrooms. But um, they were actually really good sports. And um, both of them, like, tried like tried everything. And one of our um, one of our really good friends, he was like, yeah, he's like, he's like, this is actually really good. He's like, I'm still not going to eat mushrooms after this, but I enjoyed it. So I took that as a compliment. If we had a subtitle for this, it would have to be something about the mushroom episode or something like that because this is it's being brought up so much Uh, like mushrooms i like mushrooms clearly (laughs) i love mushrooms yeah absolutely so i guess let's just get right into our interview today with the the dirty vegan Catherine gill Catherine gill is a writer blogger and holistic vegan chef who specializes in natural and health foods she studied and found her passion in writing literature and social science in college She created the popular blog, The Dirty Vegan, in 2010, focusing on comfort food-style vegan recipes that are fun, accessible, and healthy. She also ran Dirty Vegan Foods, a vegan bakery specializing in veganized versions of classic desserts. She has an active social media presence, especially on Twitter. Follow her at The Dirty Vegan. She currently resides in New England with her husband, daughter, and rescue dog. Catherine is here today to talk about her new book, The Dirty Vegan Cookbook. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. Well, we're thrilled to have you on. It's myself, Margo, and on the line today, we have Kristen. Hello. Catherine, I'm going to ask you the first question, and I'm just going to get this out of the way. Please don't judge me. I am a meat eater (laughs) and an animal lover, by the way. But I know that I need to cut down and and expand my culinary horizons. Can you offer advice for somebody like me who does want to be more kind to the world? Is there a way to kind of gradually work to being a vegan-ish person? Yes, there is. The best way to do it, I always say, is do Meatless Monday and just uh, partake in that. And just try to either do like a meatless all day on Monday, or you can just do one meal, you know, maybe just dinner or, or whatever, you know, just plan for that. And you can even do like a easy thing, you know, have your crock pot going, you know, cause like Mondays are tough, you know, it's the beginning of the work week for everybody. And, you know, it, it Mondays are, are kind of tough for everybody. So you could just put like throw everything in and do like a stew or like just anything like a soup and just put a bunch of veggies in there. You could do some imitation meats. And, um, you know, when you come home from work, it'll be ready. And so that's what I would tell anybody who wants to, like, start to get acclimated in a vegan lifestyle to do something like that. Awesome. So I think that 
a lot of people hear vegan and and they tend to automatically assume that their only options are going to be like quinoa and kale. But I really love that um, you seem pretty, pretty bent on dispelling this notion. And book and also your bakery specializes in vegan versions of desserts that people know yeah. that are like real desserts, not, you know, not something right. um, hippie sounding and that tastes like dirt. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, yeah. So without getting too much into it, because I don't want to give away too much of the book, but can you talk about some of the common swaps that you use to veganize baked goods? Because I'm going to admit like baking is a little bit foreign to me. I'm good at cooking. I can, I can cook vegan all day. Baking though throws me for a big old loop. Yeah. There's such a science to baking. And when I started the bakery, it was really like getting used to that, you know, as a person who used to cook pastry and things like that before, like, you know, to bake before being vegan and then to do it vegan, you know, it's, you just get used to a little bit of a different way, but you'd be surprised how many things you could actually just omit the egg and then whatever they call for dairy. So say the recipe calls for, you know, milk, you just use almond milk or sometimes like almond milk might be a little bit too runny for the recipe. You use a soy milk and you would be surprised just omitting the egg for a lot of recipes actually just works. So it's a lot of trial and error for that stuff. But um, anytime you need an egg substitute, for baking, you could use a banana, you can use applesauce um, as a binder, flax and chia work awesome. And then now, nowadays, there's so many good egg replacers. So you can just go out and buy like the, the vegan egg, the no egg, like there's just so many things. There used to be one, like when I first turned vegan, there was one and it was hard to find. So you really did have to adapt using the flax and, and different things. But now like you can't go to like a store and not be able to find the vegan stuff. So it's actually really a, a great and exciting time for people to be vegan and to turn vegan or just experiment with it. So yeah, for baking, I would say just like find a good substitute and like find what works for you, just play around with it. It's really fun. So you began the Dirty Vegan blog in 2010, correct? Yeah. So so tell us how that all got started. How did you get into the blogging world? Well, before that, before like blogs were really, you know, the thing, I was going on forums and that's like before blogs were even kind of like existing um everything was like done kind of on forums and you would just go on there and I was doing PETA too so I was doing a lot of activism stuff um through the PETA 2 street team and um you know writing letters and making phone calls and to politicians and to companies and just doing a lot of activism stuff protests and handing out flyers and stuff like that and I wanted to take it further so like I was getting really popular on the forums and people were coming to me asking me like, what do I substitute for this? What do I do for that? And I'm like, this is like really helpful to a lot of people. And I, at that time, you know, you can't really make a living off being an activist alone. So I was working in the corporate world and I was working in an office and people were so interested in my vegan lifestyle. They're like, how do you like wear heels and, and, um, you know, makeup and, you know, what your brain for lunch, they were so interested in like, about my lifestyle because it looked so normal and it didn't look like the you know misconception that I was a hippie. So everybody was like really, you know, picking my brain all the time. So I said, you know what, I'm answering all the same questions all the time to all these different people. Let me just start a blog. Cause that's when people started, you know, blogs. And that's when I kind of like discovered blogs around 2010 ish. So I started to put all the resources that people were coming to me asking, and I just put it online on my blog. And I started the dirtyvegan.blogspot, and that's where it started. (laughs) And it just blew up. Everybody was like, oh, my God, you know, this is just the greatest thing. It's so helpful. I got so many, like, wonderful emails from people and families that were just like, you help us so much. You know, we wanted to turn vegan and and be healthier and, and, you know, and feed our kids and, like, to give them something they'll actually like, you know, because, like, kids are picky enough as it is so like if you you're not going to give them salad they're not going to eat that they wanted like rich comfort food like stuff you can trick your your family into eating you know like the stuff I make macaroni and cheese and stuff like that so people are just so thankful that they found my blog and yeah it just blew up from there with like just social media stuff and everything it's been really great let's talk a little bit about processed vegan food because you mentioned earlier a little bit about you know you can throw in some of the the faux meats and there are several recipes in the dirty vegan cookbook that 
you know, say like, you know, vegan bacon or use, um, I'm trying to think of the, the bacon one was one that I just was looking at and thinking, Ooh, that might be really good. But I know that people get a little divided on using the processed stuff versus making everything, you know, from scratch and from veggies and, and all of that. So I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your take on that, whether you think that that's an okay daily thing, or if that's, you know, if those things are more of a treat, or if you have any other guidelines, or if it's just like a, you know what, you do you, everybody needs to figure out what works for them. Right. Yeah. You know what? I, I've thought about that a lot. And um, the recipes that I make and that I use in my everyday lifestyle and the stuff that's in the book is so versatile that you can substitute whole foods for certain things. So like when I say vegan cream cheese, you can use the, you know, the tofu, whatever you buy in the tub, like the Daya or, you know, there's so many, so many options out there, or you can use like the slightly healthier, less processed. Like there's um, one that's made out of, you know, almonds or like the ones that are made of cashews, or you can make your own. So I actually do that. Like sometimes when I don't have something on hand or if I'm in the store, I'm like, ah, that's a little bit too expensive. I'll make my own. So a lot of times I'll make like my own sour cream, my own, my vegan cream cheese. So I'll use cashews or I'll use tofu for, to make a nice sour cream. I'll just blend up the tofu with a little bit of um, lemon juice and some seasonings. So to make a nice sour cream. So you can do that with chickpeas. So like, I love how the recipes in the book, I'm not like recommending really like to go out and, you know, like you have to get this, you have to get that. It's like, I kind of leave it open, like very open-ended. So people can go out and, you know, um, they can make their own veggie bacon with tempeh, you know, you can make so much. So it's basically who has the time to do what. So you can do everything raw or like, you know, less processed if you want to, but you can also go out and buy, you know, whatever's convenient for you. If it's on sale or you just the type that just wants to go to Whole Foods and just buy everything processed. So it's just like, you know, if you're a convenience person in that aspect, but I like that I, I switch off um, on and off all the time, you know, just day to day, whatever I'm feeling, but it's like also a balanced thing too, because you don't want to do too much process and you don't want to do too much like, you know, health food where you're just feeling like you're not satisfied so it's just like kind of keeping everything in moderation, checking the ingredient label always. I always say that, like, I'll never buy a processed food if it's got like junk in it. Like, you know, sometimes I will, I'll treat myself or whatever and say, hey, you know, this is the only option I have today. But I read, I'm like meticulous about reading the labels, checking all the ingredients and everything, looking at the sodium content and just kind of keeping track of what I'm eating throughout the day. So I'm not eating too much of one thing. So I think it's just like that, you know, and yeah, like you said, everybody you know, kind of does what they do or what they can do in their situation and, you know, whatever works for for you, you know. So we were talking off the air just before we did this interview and Chris and I both got a copy of your book, The Dirty Vegan. And who's your publisher? Is it pronounced Hatherley? Hatherley. Hatherley. Yes, Hatherley Press. It is a beautiful, gorgeous book and it is so easy to read. And you have so many cool recipes here and they look like they're fun and they're easy to put together. So do you have any particular favorites in here that you want to talk about? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. The book is, I agree. It's just so beautiful and the, the ease of the easy to read I like put so much work into it to make it that way so it's like thank you for saying that I love that people are recognizing that because like a lot of people are telling me that because it's like it literally takes years off of your life to write a book and <laughs> I was like oh, it was just really it, it's a lot of work and and I made it that way purposely like to make it easy so it, that takes a lot of work to do that like to kind of say you know onions chopped and then like to do all it's like to try to think of your mind the way that you would do it and the way I do things in the kitchen as a chef to make things easier on, you know, the person you're writing the recipe, you know, or doing the recipe rather. So, you know, I, I wanted it to be that way. So thanks so much for recognizing that because it, it actually worked out wonderful. And uh, yes, my favorite recipes in the book, I love the macaroni and cheese, the baked macaroni and cheese, because it's so good. It is so rich and indulgent, also comforting and fulfilling. Mm -hmm. So everything is really satisfying. There's, a, there's some good pizza recipes in there, appetizers and dips and stuff. It's just, I, I really, it's hard. Like whenever people ask me what my favorite or my favorites in the book is, it's like hard. It's like, like saying like, who's your favorite child? <laughs> like, it's like, I love, they're all my babies. Like I made every recipe like where I feel that it's perfect. So it's like, I love every single one of them. Were there any recipes that you really love that ended up being cut from the finished book? 
No, nothing, nothing. Oh. I could have put more if I, if I wanted to, it was just, uh, I, I would just, it would be forever and ever. The book would be huge. And I wanted to keep it to the point where the book is such a perfect size where you can take it to the grocery store. And in the beginning of the book, after the introduction is a pantry guide, the vegan pantry guide, which it's to, to my knowledge, one of the only pantry guides in any uh, vegan cookbook. And I'm the cookbook collector. So I have never seen this before into the specifically focusing on vegan food. So there might be one out there. I'm not saying there's not, but um, I, you know, I made it this way so that people can actually take this book to the grocery store. And it's an A through Z alphabetized pantry guide. And you can actually go and stock your entire pantry, like non-complicated food. Things are easy to find in no matter what grocery store you're at. And the stuff that will be able to not only um, for the recipes in the book, but for just a, a nice balanced vegan life. So if you want to eat a vegan diet and be balanced about it, and you know, a lot of people come to me and say, what do you do? I want to be vegan, but how do I do it? What do I eat? What do I make? Where do I buy the food? You know, like, what do I buy? Where do I start? And that vegan pantry guide pretty much like takes care of all that for you. So I don't want to put too many recipes. There's over a hundred recipes in there. And I think that's perfect for the type of book it is right now. And then maybe the next one will, you know, be, be you know, a lot of recipes or more recipes, but this is basically like a starter book. It gets you, you know, knowing about veganism, knowing why I did it. You've got your pantry guide, get you started, and you've got all your recipes with nice little stories along with each recipe. So, uh, I, and I wanted it so people can take it to the store with them. So it works out great. It's a perfect size for that. Agreed. Flipping through it, I noticed you have quite a few interesting celebrities in here. You, you include their favorite recipe. So I wanted to know, how did you get into the business of creating recipes for vegan celebs? Yes, so exciting. I just, I started connecting with the celebrities on social media because they started reading my blog and they would just come to me and say, hey, I love your blog. And it's like, still like to this day, I'm just like, I can't even it contain my excitement about it. It's just I, I just can't believe it. Like people that I have, they've been my idols like throughout this whole vegan journey. And I never even thought I would ever like meet them. And like now they come to me and they're like, you know, can you give me recipes for my personal chef? And, you know, can you give me advice on yoga? And can you, you know, help me out? You know, what's a substitute for this? And they're, you know, sending me DMs and stuff. And they're like my friends now. So it's really cool. And, and uh, it was really great. So the, the three celebrities that are in the book are of, uh, you know, my friends that we've, we met through online and um, there's just so many more. It's just, you become friends with these people. You, you start to give them advice and um, you know, you just, uh, you just I, I'm just making so many wonderful connections with just everyone all around the world. So it's actually this blog and this life has taken me to such a cool place in my life. So I'm just really proud of it. And it's so exciting. Oh, yeah, you should be proud. That's awesome. We hear a lot of readers and listeners saying that they don't have the time or they don't have the money to eat vegan meals. So I'm, I'm curious, do you find vegan dishes to be more time consuming and or costly than their traditional counterparts? Or like, do you have to shop in specialty health food stores or, you know, search for weird things generally? Or is that is that just kind of a myth? Well, in the past, I did notice that that was sometimes the case. There's a lot of vegan cookbooks out there that are just really specialty and they're really like, you know, complicated. And they're like, yeah, you got to go to this specialty food market for this and that. So when I designed the Dirty Vegan Cookbook, it was where you can just go to any store. Like, so I made it so that you can shop at the Dollar Tree because they have like a lot of vegan food at the Dollar Tree and um, or, you know, Price Right or you know, Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. I need it so that you can get this stuff practically anywhere. And you're staying out of the specialty food stores for the most part. And then the, there's just a couple recipes where I'm like, yeah, you could put this optionally. So if you want to like take it up a notch, you can use this. But all those like kind of specialty th items, that's an optional. So I made it you know, like that on purpose. But I noticed too, like, we're living in a, a wonderful time where like everything is a reasonable price. That's a vegan product. So I even like go into the store sometimes and I post it on social media. I'll take a package of like field roast or tofurkey sausages, and then I'll go to find it's equivalent in the animal product version. And it's actually cheaper or the same for that weight and, and that particular product. So if you go to like get 
an organic or like a, you know, like an artisan sausage, it's actually like $11 for the package or more, like way more than usually I can get a pack of sausages from anywhere between like $2.99 to $4.99. So I think that it's just, we've been so trained to think that vegan food is expensive, it's complicated. And, and now, you know, we're starting to see that it's not. But a lot of, a lot, for many years, and maybe it was like that, because really when I first went vegan, it was way different. You know, there was not the availability of the products that there are now, and there wasn't the resources. Like you couldn't Google vegan recipes and get much. But nowadays, like the vegan blogs that are out there are wonderful. The vegan cookbooks are beautiful. And it's just like the resources. You can just go on social media and like talk to folks like me and we're responsive and we're just writing you back. Like, yeah, you know, here's what you can put, you know, but that wasn't like that back in the day. So I think right now, probably the time too has changed. It's much easier now. So are there any uh, vegan products that have been introduced in the market, let's say in the last year or so that you're really excited about that used to not exist? Oh yeah. So many, like so many of like the processed stuff, which like the processed stuff, that's vegan I noticed is like much healthier than the other stuff so like you know less less sodium usually no cholesterol because all vegan food is zero cholesterol and you know not full of the junky products you look on the back and it's like you know much less ingredients than it would be the counterpart but I, so I, I do like the processed stuff like there's just like really cool stuff out there like uh corn dogs there's vegan corn dogs out there which like it's kind of a pain in the neck to make corn dogs like not that much, but you still, you have to make your cornbread, um, you know, breading and, you know, you got to find, you know, whatever vegan hot dog you want to make, which there's a good availability for those. But you still got to make it. You got to dip them. It could be messy. So now they actually have them where you can buy them in the store. There's so just stuff like that. Tons more vegan cheese. Lots of vegan cheese out there. The milk. Like the milk game has just like increased to like this crazy amount. Like you can get any vegan milk you want. It's so exciting. Like you can get hazelnut milk, flax milk, coconut milk, soy milk, rice milk, almond milk, like any milk that you can even think of. And then even like more than that. <laughs> so it's like really cool. Cashew milk. I mean, like cashew milk is my favorite. Me too. Me too. Isn't it? In my coffee, oh, I love so it. Good. It's, yeah. Isn't it? It's just like so incredible. Like, it's delicious and it's you know nutritious it, if you get a few different milks like I do. Like I'll get flax, soy, because I like to have the protein. I'll get pea. So there's like a brand called Ripple that has like pea protein and like almond and stuff like that. So I'll just have like a variety always in my fridge. And then that way I just use a bunch of different ones throughout the day. And it's also like really nutritionally balanced too. So yeah, I'm just excited about everything. All the vegan products are awesome right now. Well, and I, I've got to say, like, it's so nice for me to have things like the corn dogs or, you know, just a, a variety of, you know, like burger patties or vegan hot dogs so that when I go, because I'm never one to want to go to somebody's, you know, party or, you know, cookout or anything and expect them to have things for me. But I like to right. come with things that I can eat because I like to eat with people and I like to not seem weird and I don't want to just nibble right. on a lettuce. So I, I'm totally with you. I, I think that that's, that's great. Yeah. Um, and it's like, it's just great. You can get either, you can get the prepared food or it's just so much easier to make food now because there's just the availability of products and just the resources. Like years ago, we didn't know that you can use aquafaba. So that's the uh, liquid that's in the chickpea can. So before you used to just drain it and throw it out. Yeah. So now you can actually use that. So you could just like reserve that juice and you could use that to make macaroons and you can make just so many like really cool, you know, like French macaroons, like who thought that we can have those and like now we can. And you can use that to make all sorts of things that you would use egg whites in. Yeah. So I just, it's, it's just the resources. So it's stuff we always had. We always had chickpeas in that, that juice, the aquafaba juice, but we just never knew what to do with it. So I think the knowledge is just better now. It's the education of how to live a vegan lifestyle is just there now. And it's really awesome. Yeah. So I understand you have a rescue dog. We were just talking about corn dogs. Now let's talk about rescue dogs. Um, <laughs> do you, would you care to tell us a little bit about him or her? Oh, she, yes, she is wonderful. Her name is Shirley and she is a Kelpie, which when we first rescued her, we thought she was either a mix or she looked like a German shepherd in the picture um, from the shelter. 
So they said they don't really know what she was. She might be a German Shepherd. She might be a mixed breed, you know, whatever. We just wanted to rescue a dog. So it didn't really matter. But we had a German Shepherd in the past, you know, a rescue dog that she had gotten really old and sick and she had passed away. So, you know, after a couple of years from that went by and we decided to rescue Shirley, um, we thought, okay, that's great. You know, we have knowledge of German Shepherds, you know, so it'll work perfect if she is. Well, we go to take her to the vet and we find out she is not a mixed dog. She's a full bred, pure breed Kelpie, which is an Australian cattle dog, a type of one. And she just like was doing all these crazy things and we had no idea why. And then the veterinarian explained it all to us and we were like, oh, that is why she's hurting us. So she would hurt us (laughs) like we were cattle. (laughs) Yes, yes. She would hurt us like we were cattle or sheep. And, uh, you know, so I'd have like get togethers, you know, before we had a a child, you know, you have a lot more cocktail parties and stuff. So we would have get togethers and you have people, you know, walking around the house mingling and she was just running around us. And we were naturally just not even paying attention because we're all talking and we're like going into this big like pile in the middle all talking and then once you look around you stop and you realize what happened the dog herded us in the middle of the living room (laughs) 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 but she's wonderful she's just such a wonderful you know dog and she's just she's lovely she's great I love her she's just uh she's my baby and she's just very protective and she's just like wonderful she just is very much protective of her pack you know like She's just a really, really cool dog. You know, she just like loves her family so much. And, you know, you could tell she's just like, just this is a pack, you know, like, so she, she's just really like great. What a good demeanor she has, you know, it's just, it's nice. She fits in perfectly with our vibe here. We're big lovers of animals on the FPG podcast. So we will always listen to those stories and she sounds adorable. I have one more question for you if you're ready for it. Yeah. So we ask, we ask if it's everybody who comes on to the show. So here it is. Catherine, what was the last song you listened to before you did this podcast interview? Oh, that's such a cool question. Oh, my gosh. I love that because I love music. I actually play the guitar, but I'm not really good at it. But Same um, here. <laughs> I just, I'm a lover of music. and I, Yes. Oh, my gosh. I love it. I just I love music. I just lo- absolutely adore it. It's like my you know, my second passion next to veganism and health and being a chef and then author and writer and all that. So the last song I listened to was Led Zeppelin going to California. Nice. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> because it's kind of Joni awesome. Mitchell-esque, you know, but it's hard rock. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. That's like one of my favorites. I was listening to that like a couple times over and over before the podcast. Oh, that's it's a good one. Such a great choice. Great. Such a great song. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. You were great. This was so much fun. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun talking to you both. Love this show? Tell us why in a five-star review on iTunes, and we'll read it on the air. Also, make sure you are a subscriber. If you want to reach out to say hi or have a question about a recent episode, yay, well, feel free to email us at podcast at fitfoundgirls.com. And if this podcast jives perfectly with your brand, consider sponsoring the show. Get more info by emailing advertising at fitbottomgirls.com. Find all kinds of Fit Bottom goodness online and on social media at Fit Bottom Girls, Fit Bottom Mamas, Fit Bottom Eats, and Fit Bottom Zen. And if books and movies are your thing, check out the other podcast I co-host called Book vs. Movie, which you can find anywhere where you search for podcasts. Thanks for listening.